Good afternoon. Welcome to Asia Society Hong Kong Center, uh, episode 14, uh, Coronavirus Update. Uh, I am Executive Director Alice Mong, and it is my great pleasure uh, to host episode 14. It's been uh, quite a few since February 14 when we started this uh, uh, project, this program. And I'm delighted that today we have Dr. Peter Forster joining us from UK. And before I int formally introduce you, just give you a bit of update uh, on what's happening around the world in the world of COVID-19. Uh, currently, for over 4 million, it's about 4.2 million cases, uh, about over 290,000 deaths. And uh, here in Hong Kong, we just today reported, uh, it's the first time in 23 days, we've had a local transmission. And in fact, just a few hours ago, we heard that a five-year-old uh, might have been infected by a grandparent. And so 1048 is our number here in Hong Kong. And this last couple of days, we're seeing a spike in South Korea and Germany, uh, despite um, you know great measures that they're doing uh, over the weekends. Uh, this last, there's been an uh, uh, uptick in, in those areas. And unemployment rate is high in the US, uh, record high in China, and as well as Hong Kong. And also a member, senior member of the White House staff, including Dr. Fauci, is in self-isolation uh, because of a possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, working with as a senior, a senior member of the White House has been uh, diagnosed with COVID. So that's really the background of COVID-19 as of February 13, 2020. And today we have Dr. Peter Forster, fellow of McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research, University of Cambridge, and UK Director of Research, Institute of, for Forensic Genetics, Munster, Germany, joining us. And we're delighted to welcome Dr. Forster. Um, Dr. Forster, tell us about your research and what are you working on right now uh, in, in the area of COVID-19? Good morning, with pleasure. So uh, my research is based on looking at the early outbreak uh, and in order to study how the outbreak initially spread amongst humans, we uh, took the first 160 high quality genomes available on the International GISA database. So the first patient was uh, sampled on the 24th of December on Christmas Eve. And uh, in this early phase up to the end of February, the database contained 160 high quality genomes. So uh, based on my previous experience from the 1990s in uh, developing algorithms to study rapidly mutating genomes, these are called phylogenetic network algorithms, um, we were able to produce quite quickly a, uh, a, a relationship, a tree of relationships between these early viruses telling us how they developed in this first phase of spreading amongst humans. Um, for those of you who are joining on Zoom, uh, we're going to put the, uh, a copy of the phylogenetic network map uh, online uh, on, on, Zoom, on Zoom and also on uh, Facebook as well as Asia Society website for those of you who want to follow uh, the discussion uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Forster uh, about this, uh, uh, his research. And you and your, you they came up with some really interesting kind of snapshot of the pandemic's origin. And can you kind of describe briefly uh, the, what is this, uh, this, this tree, this network and uh, phylogenetic network analysis? Yes, um, so briefly, um, we uh, reconstructed uh, the uh, relationships between these early virus genomes. So it would have started with a single virus infecting a human, that human would have started uh, spreading the virus to others. And as the virus infects more and more people, it, it also mutates about one or two mutations per month, creating several different virus types and more and more as time goes on. And to reconstruct from the existing viruses, let's say in January, February, what the original ones looked like, you need a, a, a mathematical algorithm. And this is something we developed in the 1990s. And it has been very successful in reconstructing how prehistoric humans uh, colonized our planet. And uh, fortunately, it works extremely well also for reconstructing how the virus has been spreading. 
So this phylogenetic network algorithm has the advantage of showing you all the mathematically optimal solutions at one glance. So the one we published shows all 288 optimal mathematical trees. If you only present one tree, the chances are more than 99% that you're wrong and you got the wrong tree. But if you show all 288 at one glance in one graph, you are pretty sure you've got the correct solution included. And then you can start doing all the basic research, which we then did. So uh, to summarize the um, important aspects, we found that um, there are really three early types, A, B, and C, we labeled them, of the virus. So A distinguishes from a B by uh, two mutations. One of them changes the appearance of the virus. It changes the protein of the virus. And then uh, A is found um, across uh, parts of China in this early phase. Uh, uh, later, it also is found in America, brought there by people who travel there and in Australia. Then we have the B type developing. This is the predominant type, to my surprise, in, in Wuhan and in mainland China, not the A-type, even though the A-type is older. Uh, and uh, this was initially a surprise to me because we had read in the media reports that the Wuhan fish market was the source of the outbreak. And then I wondered why is A not more common in Wuhan? So I think my initial conclusion would be perhaps we need to look beyond Wuhan in other parts of China, uh, which potentially are candidates for the source of the outbreak. For example, we found quite a, a few A-types in Guangdong. We also find an A-type in Yunnan. So these are areas where there are bat populations, and so perhaps we should look there as well. And then we have from B developing a C-type that is rare in mainland China, at least in this initial outbreak, but it is, for example, uh, represented in Singapore, in, in, in Korea, and uh, from there, it was one of the first types to spread uh, to Europe via uh, business travelers. So in a nutshell, um, we were able to find the age uh, or the oldest type by comparing it with the bat coronavirus. That showed us that the A type is the ancestral type. And uh, my understanding is uh, C type, uh, the one that's found in South Korea and Singapore and also Hong Kong, um, it kind of appears to be absent from mainland uh, China. At what point do you think uh, the uh, B-type mutated into the, the C-type then? Uh, it is actually interesting that um, uh, we've taken a closer look at more data now available, and we see this C-type is, although it was absent in the mainland Chinese sample, it is found in uh, people who traveled to France from China and they were the early uh, French cases in, in late January. So my interpretation of that is that in late January, the C-type was already present in mainland China, but at very low frequency, and it happened to be carried out by a, a Chinese group of, of visitors to France. And that's why we know it probably must have existed in China in late January. But there, um, I saw a, a report, an, an article in SCMP, and I think this is quoting a report from uh, the infection uh, journal, Infection, Genetic and Evolution, suggesting that there were, um, in December, uh, found in France, uh, a French study that found a European patient becoming infected at the end of December, almost a month before it was uh, actually arrived. Uh, do you have information on that? Well, that, that's quite right. This is new. This is fairly new, this discovery that there was a French case a month before these Chinese visitors I mentioned. And um, it doesn't uh, totally surprise me, I have to say, because one part of our follow-up study was to look at time estimates when the, um, uh, the outbreak started. Now, we know for sure that uh, the earliest case with, with symptoms was on the 1st of December. This is published in The Lancet and has been reviewed by experts, so there's no doubt about it. On the 1st of December, we already have the first uh, case with symptoms, although unfortunately no, no genomic data was taken from this patient at the time. 
Also, there is, I believe, a, uh, a, a newspaper report uh, on uh, a potentially early case on the 17th of November. But again, this is only a media report. It is not a, a scientific study. Um, so what we did, we wanted to know when did this outbreak start? And the way we did it, we took um, uh, over a thousand genomes uh, available until the 24th of March. And then we looked at how fast the virus mutates. So as I mentioned, the virus mutates are roughly one or two mutations per month. So some people have zero mutations, others have three mutations, but on average, you will get roughly uh, one to two mutations per month accumulating. And, and now our surprise was we found that in East Asia, the uh, mutation speed is about one and a half mutations per month. But outside East Asia, for example, Europe, America, Australia, the mutation rate is faster. The virus seems to have accelerated. It's more like 2.1 mutations per month. And the difference is statistically significant. Now, let's leave aside the reasons for that um, and apply now our East Asian mutation rate as a clock to find out when the outbreak started. So in other words, when did the virus have zero mutations? And we worked out through what we call a, what is a linear regression, that the outbreak must have started between September the 13th and before December the 7th. So at some point between these two dates. And that is what is called our 95% confidence interval. So to put it in other words, there is, a five, uh, there is only a 5% possibility that the uh, virus outbreak started before September the 13th or after December the 7th. Now, December the 7th is not controversial because, as I mentioned, uh, we already know definitely there were cases from December the 1st onwards. Um, but September the 13th might be uh, a movable feast or flexible. We have to see because I have to give a, a health warning for my own time estimate, which is we are assuming that the virus has mutated at a constant speed in the past in order to get to this date. But as I've already said, the virus has accelerated apparently in its mutation speed outside Asia. So we can't be sure that it hasn't also changed its mutation speed months ago. But for the moment, that's the best estimate we can offer based on the data we have, is that uh, the outbreak um, probably started sometime uh, late October, early November, that would be the sort of central estimate. Right. I, I guess going back to this article, again, I'm reading this paper from May, early May, the Infection Genetic and Evolution Journal. It says the pathogen thought to have made the jump uh, from initial host to human sometime between October 6th and December 11th. And so it kind of also kind of narrowed down from your timeline of September to also around that same time. Um, so it's really I, I, yeah please I, I, I can I think I've got uh, um, um, the explanation for that um, it is as I say unexpected that we find different mutation rates in East Asia from outside East Asia now if you average those two mutation rates and simply take the overall mutation rate you will get a slightly younger date than we did and and that is why there is uh, a younger date in their estimate because they did not distinguish East Asia from uh, the rest of the world. So I think anecdotally, we also heard that some of the doctors in Italy had said they had, they heard, you know, from news reports, symptoms uh, in, in the, around, uh, in the uh, uh, November period of, of uh, possibly in Italy. So, so how um, do you think you will be able to find uh, with uh, this regression, you know, the, uh, I guess that's a big question to going back to, where, you know, the origin of it. Uh, do you think that's an area that you're working toward? Um, I think everybody seems to be curious uh, where it did it come from and when. Right now, everybody is uh, saying it's the bats, it's the Chinese eating the bats. I mean, it's like a lot of finger pointing, uh, which may not be helpful, but I think uh, your research, would it lead to that, uh, you know, kind of that response kind of crystal, uh, is that, or is that too, too much to, to hope for? I, well, I think we need to distinguish two different aspects here. So what our research can do is to look where the virus initially spread uh, amongst humans. 
Um, what we haven't addressed, but others have addressed this, is uh, which species did it come from? Indeed, is it perhaps an artificial virus? You know, all sorts of theories and rumors have been around. Um, so uh, the, the consensus is at the moment that the, the bat coronavirus is the closest to the one we have now. It's 96% identical. Um, there is some discussion whether there was a host in between uh, which modified it, um, for example, the pangolin. Um, uh, my, my impression is that the pangolin, if there is any relationship, it would have been prior to the infection, so a long ago. We are still, however, left with the problem that the bat is considerably different from humans. Um, and if you translate the mutation rate into years, the difference between the bat and the human is probably decades. And uh, so we, we have this problem, either the virus has been circulating in some humans for decades, or um, the bat that we have is not the closest relative. There is some other bat or even some other animal which is even closer than 96% to us. Um, and then the third possibility is the bat is the closest, but there has been some complicated mixture of, of genome with, with something else. And, and that's where, for example, the pangolin theory comes in. Uh, so these three uh, origins uh, need to be looked at. Um, so what we can only do is see where the early spread is. And the early spread appears to be in East Asia, in China. Uh, but what we're saying, not necessarily Wuhan. So perhaps the wet market is, is not the first suspect. I see. Um... Your study also uh, find that most of the type C's are in Europe. Um, and since your study was initially published, have you taken a, a kind of a closer look at cases in UK? Right now we're seeing uh, UK is getting really a large number of, of, of spike and also the, the mortality, the death rate has been very high. So um, are they predominantly, of, is there one type or cluster? And it's also, is there any correlation between the type of COVID-19 variant and the fatality rate? Well, you are touching on a very hot topic here. I, um, I describe or we describe in our paper what happened up to February. But as I said, we got an update three weeks later for the end of March. And to my amazement, these early types we see, the C types, the A types in America, C types in Europe, they are very quickly within uh, weeks, three, three weeks, being replaced by a particularly successful B-type. Now, this is a B-type we described in the paper. So uh, you, are, uh, you find it in Shanghai, um, and uh, it traveled to Europe in, in January, and then it popped up in Italy. And from there, it has taken over Europe, and also in America, it has become a dominant type. And the question now you then quite rightly ask, uh, how on earth did this massive change in a very short space of time, how was this achieved by, by these, uh, this B-type virus? Um, and there has been a, a group independently of us who are preparing a, a, a study, or it's close to publication in uh, Los Alamos, um, who have looked at patients in the UK, in Sheffield, who have either this mutated B-type, which has spread so successfully across the world, and those patients in Sheffield who have other coronavirus types, but not this one. And um, what they see, what they seem to see, and these are preliminary results, um, is that the patients with the successful mutated B-type have a higher viral load in their airways. And then it makes sense that if you have more viruses, you are able to infect people at a higher rate. Every time you cough or sneeze, you just simply spread a larger number of viruses. And, and this would be a neat explanation why this mutated B-type that we saw in our paper, and which already looked odd, um, that that has now become dominant across uh, all parts of the world where it is introduced. You also, uh, I think in your study, looked at um, the connection between Wuhan to Mexico over a period of month, maybe I think you already touched upon that. Wuhan went to Shanghai, then Munich, then Italy, and then where it was picked up, I guess, in eventually in Mexico, all in one month time. Um, you know, based on, I think, your mapping data, 
Do you think uh, government's action on travel bans um, and quarantine have, have slowed down the virus mutation and spread? Let, let me first just comment. The type you point out in our paper, quite rightly, that is precisely this B type, which has proven to be so successful, this mutated one. You will see that the Wuhan type seems comfortable with a particular genome type. It's a big fat yellow circle in our diagram. And from that, you see this very long branch shooting off all the way to Europe and then to Mexico, 10 mutations. And that immediately struck us, this is odd. And this is exactly, as you mentioned, the successful type, which has now taken over. Um, and uh, yes, uh, the question now arises, could this have been prevented? Uh, I think um, what happened here is that the Italian government early on closed down flights. Um, but elsewhere in Europe, uh, the same action was not taken. And I think Italy was more or less isolated in doing so. And they got this infection anyway. So I think the lesson is that um, a single nation is at the mercy of its neighbors in a sense that you have to take this action collectively. Otherwise, um, you know, you really risk experimenting with a virus and you don't know which way it's going to mutate. It might seem harmless to begin with, but who knows uh, what it can turn into. Uh, so, yes, I very much think that um, a collective action here would have been very helpful. So I guess here um, we've heard uh, Dr. Gabriel Leung talk about suppression and lift. And right now it seems to me globally, uh, many of the countries and in the United States states are talking about lifting uh, because of economic reasons. And if there is not a coordinated effort, you can uh, lift, but it's still going to, you know, it travels in the mutation also, as you said, um, you know, it, the, the rates, they seems to be there a way of speeding up. I read uh, over the weekend, uh, I think in, in the state of Florida, the, uh, I'm sorry, state of uh, Georgia lifted and, uh, and they attracted uh, maybe 60,000 plus uh, from other states coming in. And so, so I guess, like you said, the coordination is going to be very important. And I guess many of us are looking at traveling again. We would love some of us families are in the States, but in terms of traveling again, it's going to be, uh, do you also see uh, it's going to be a while uh, because of the way this, this uh, virus has been traveling, also mutating, um, you know, how, how soon, I mean, I guess that's the question, how soon can we get back to normal? And I kind of get the sense that there is no normal anymore or a new normal. Um. Well, I, I, it's difficult for me to, to look into the future, but, but what I can perhaps say is we will have to live for a while in a world where even if restrictions are lifted, there will be sporadic cases popping up. These then will have to be effectively tracked and traced. And this can, can be possibly done with mobile phone applications. Um, and, uh, and another important tool I hope that we have delivered is that you can directly use the genome to find out um, who are the likely sources of this particular infection. Is this a genotype? We've seen this before in Vietnam, or is it perhaps a type we've seen in Italy? And then you can ask the person who has sporadically come up with an infection, have you been in touch with someone from Vietnam or someone from Italy? And then you can narrow down and perhaps impose a very effective quarantine. So I'm hoping that that is a potential tool in addition to the other tools that are available. And as you say, I think it'll be a while before we get on top of this. And in terms of collaboration, what I found interesting with COVID um, is this is the, the research project your, uh, is really your project is collaboration between several researchers. And it seems to me right now with technology and also how fast this uh, um, uh, COVID is traveling, that can you talk a bit about the kind of the collaboration? Uh, right now, it seems on political uh, level, there is a lot of blame. But I think on the scientific level, uh, there seems to be a lot of collaborations and, uh, you, you know, uh, with journals, with technology. So can you uh, touch upon that uh, a little bit? It seems to me that to me it's, it's a hopeful uh, um, area where mm -hmm. that's where how we're going to find our, maybe the vaccines and then and, uh, possible um, uh, dealing of this virus. Yeah. Uh, my personal impression is that um, the scientific advances that we are able to see at this early stage come from years of preparation. So um, if you are spontaneously setting up 
something now to deal with the problem. Um, it will take time and, and we don't have time. And uh, may I point to successful examples? So for example, the uh, database from which I, I gained the data with my colleagues for the genomes which enabled our research, the GISAID database, this was not set up overnight. This has been around for over 10 years. It was initially a private initiative and was designed for influenza viruses, for tracking them and for, for accepting data from researchers worldwide. So because these, this uh, organization GISAID already existed, it was very quickly able in December, January to accommodate viral genome information for the new coronavirus. And therefore, it was very easy and quick for me to register with them and to obtain these genomes and immediately set up to, to analyze the virus. And again, I didn't start setting up algorithms. These are algorithms which we developed back in the 1990s, which worked very well and successfully. And because of all this work for over 20 years, we were able then to spring into action immediately and provided this first paper of how the virus has developed. Um, and likewise, if we look to other institutions, uh, for example, Imperial College London, they provide these um, uh, simulations to find out if we close schools, how many people will die. If we don't close schools, how many people will die. These simulations weren't done overnight either. This is a decade and more of experience which has been built up and the software for other viral outbreaks, and that is now becoming useful. Or in Oxford, we have the Jenner Institute developing vaccines and uh, they didn't come up overnight. But again, this is years and years of preparation. So this is my impression that um, the results we see coming out are, are not spontaneous collaborations. They are actually long-standing researchers who, who luckily and fortunately, and even I might say coincidentally, have been on the scene at the right time. Yes, the, I think what you're saying reminds me of my conversation with Dr. Jessica Manning, uh, who works for NIH and is based out of Phnom Penh, and her research, her field of expertise was get, uh, she was studying dengue, and she just happened to be uh, uh, the first uh, COVID patient in Cambodia, and she also genome uh, the sequencing uh, uh, in January. So I think in some ways it seems to me like a big puzzle, and each one of us, you are fitting the puzzle, but I, I think in the end, I think we might be able to find some solution and also AIDS research as well as SARS research, the vaccines for, for these research, although we don't have them, but uh, it seems to me some of the scientists are building on uh, the research from previous scientists. So the importance of collaboration, it's also important of public health policies uh, that uh, it seems to me we're all talking about it and now there is a spotlight, uh, whether it's on WHO or, or many of these, uh, whether it's Cambridge or uh, Harvard or, or many of the universities are already doing that. And now maybe with technology and also um, the way this disease, this, this COVID has kind of caught everybody by, by surprise at the, the, the speed, but the collaboration, like you said, it's always been there. And now um, I'm with that, I'm really curious um, to hear more about the University of Cambridge. Um, how do you utilize resources across the fields and discipline to work on this research? So, um, well, the, the research that we've done uh, in Cambridge, so the one we published, uh, was a, a quick, rapid response, if you will. Um, I was following the developments in, in China in January, and I realized uh, that this isn't just <laughs> uh, like a simple influenza outbreak. It is much, much more serious. And if it can't be contained, then we're going to be in trouble. Uh, and my own uh, days as a student were spent uh, partly in virology. So I have some understanding of the strengths and weaknesses in virology. And I thought definitely where I can contribute in order to speed up the process was to apply these algorithms that we had devised uh, in the last 20 years to virological problems. And there was no time therefore to set up a research team or to apply for funding. You know, that would have taken weeks to months and so we set up with uh, my wife, who fortunately is a medical doctor. My uh, brother is a clinical researcher and my professor. And we spontaneously worked day and night, really, for two months in order to get this published and done. And that was all without any funding or any 
uh, connections in that sense, except I very, I, I really have to praise the GISAID organization for having internationally provided all, all the data in order to make it all possible. Yeah, and you mentioned one example. Um, so this was the phase of sort of the pioneering research. Now, um, where do we go next? So in, in Cambridge, of course, we now have the problem that the finances are uh, all uh, have a question mark because the students can't come, you know, the uh, research funding, uh, you know, is going to be tight because the government is spending billions in order to save people's jobs. So, uh, so a lot will have to depend on, on donations in order to make sure that we can push this research further and unbureaucratically so it doesn't go through, you know, weeks of delay, you know, evaluation. We just need to move on as quickly as possible. And how do you think your work um, can be um, used to apply to detecting um, uh, epidemics of the future? It seems to me, I mean, we, we, we've seen SARS, MERS, uh, Ebola. I mean, you know, this last, I, I was just thinking about this last 10 years and now this big one, uh, COVID-19. Um, and I'm sure there's gonna be future uh, uh, epidemics and pandemics. So how do you think your work is gonna apply uh, to help detect uh, epidemics of the future and um, and how is this uh, uh, phylogenetic network analysis can be applied uh, in, you know, you, I think what you're using now is fascinating, but how, mm. how, how will that help us in the future? Well, uh, okay, I'll, I'll start first what, what we're doing now. So at the moment, we're interested actually in, in treatment. So someone has the virus, we're not going to get a vaccine very soon, therefore you need treatment uh, before the vaccine is available. And uh, what the virus does, it, it uh, penetrates the cell through the ACE2 receptor. And uh, what we're looking at is designing what are called single chain antibodies in order to block the receptor so that the virus can't get in. And in order to design these single chain antibodies, that is also where we need these networks to look at the variation to, say, to see which parts of the genome and therefore of the protein is going to enable us to design uh, these uh, single chain antibodies. So that, that is the immediate task that we have is to develop this treatment in collaboration with our Cambridge colleagues. Um, so the longer term aspect you consider is future outbreaks. Um, and that is to popularize the algorithms, the software, in order that they become a, a standard technique, a standard tool for virologists to use. So this will involve training courses, uh, which I hope to offer so that virologists then become familiar with these methods, which have been existing in human genetics for 15 years, but uh, which are newer for, for other areas of research. Okay, uh, I'm now gonna turn to questions from our um, online audience. Um, and here, um, it, one of the questions said, you have mentioned that is, there is no proof that COVID-19 is uh, originated in Wuhan. Um, what is your uh, proof of that? Well, um, I, we can't speak of proof here. So uh, the sample sizes are quite small. Um, I'll explain it as follows. We have Chinese New Year, which fell on the 25th of January this year. And this is, I believe, a, a time when families come together, they travel. And of course, there is the danger of spreading uh, the coronavirus. And for that reason, the Chinese government canceled the New Year celebrations and effectively a day before uh, also canceled travel. Um, now, I thought if we want to look at these very first few days of the outbreak to decide where the virus could have originated, we've got to remove all the complication that this New Year's travel could bring. So I took a cutoff date of January the 17th. That's one whole week before Chinese New Year and looked only at the genomes we have. There are only 43 genomes we have from uh, Christmas Eve, December the 24th, until the middle of January. Of these 43 genomes, 23 are from Wuhan. Of these 23 from Wuhan, only three are the ancestral A type and 20 are the derived B type. Whereas in the rest of China, we have about 50, 50 A and B. So these are very small numbers, so you can't have any proof either way, but it just seems to me it would be premature to focus only on Wuhan as the source. We should look at other parts of China especially because in other parts of China, you also have uh, the bat populations. 
Because my understanding is, um, I guess I, 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 um, there has been professors uh, uh, mentioning using uh, travel data. Um, I think uh, the focus has been so much on Wuhan in terms of the flights and so on, using our information to extrapolate some. But what you're talking about is um, maybe if we're just focusing on Wuhan, you're kind of missing the bigger picture of, uh, of the other parts of China. Because right now, what we're seeing in China now, there is a spike in, uh, I guess, uh, some of the infection coming from Russia. They're worried about the Heilongjiang. So, yeah. so right now, if we're just focusing on seeing that, I, not seeing the forest for the trees, I guess. So, so, uh, so what, what you're in some ways talking about is really looking at the big picture to see where it might have, um, uh, you know. Uh, I think so. And if you look at the very first paper on, on the infection in The Lancet, a very good journal, um, they analyzed the first 40 odd cases. Um, and although many of them had contact with the Wuhan fish market, the very first case on December the 1st had no contact with the Wuhan fish market. <laughs> so again, it's, um, it's perhaps a bit too rapid to say it was a fish market. I see. Um, this, another question from online, uh, quite asking about would the virus affect human genes and how does a virus uh, interact with our body? Well, the virus penetrates into our cells uh, using the ACE2 receptor, and it does that very efficiently. And um, <clears throat> there is a, a question, though, that uh, some people have, you know, more uh, severe symptoms than others. And you've probably uh, seen this uh, in, in Britain and also in the USA, especially uh, the, the black population of African descent. They seem to be disproportionately affected. Um, if you look at the raw numbers, uh, it, it seems they have a four times higher mortality rate. Um, uh, but even if you take away social factors, income if you and age, you equalize all of that, they still have a twofold higher mortality. And uh, it seems difficult to ignore the fact that there must be also some genetic component, which is con contributing to the difference in, in the way that our bodies react. And, and this is clearly now the subject of research. So I guess I, one of the things I've been always curious about, you know, here in Hong Kong, Singapore, although Singapore's numbers have uh, also gone up, but the mortality rate has been very low compared to uh, U.S. and Europe. Um, so is that can that be explained also by the the, the, the our, our different genes? You know, is that one of the I, I was. I was thinking the same, and this was one motivation for the initial research. So in Europe, even, we have a huge contrast between the very low mortality rate, for example, in Germany, apparently, and the higher rates which seem to appear in Italy. So there were initial explanations um, concerning there are different age profiles concerned in, in Germany. It was younger people being infected, in Italy it was older people, and therefore there are different mortality figures. Um, but the, the difference has has been maintained and uh, you would have thought there would be some equalizing um it's 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 complicated because at the same time we have the virus has changed as well you know you have this new type which has taken over in the world so we have different parameters changing at the same time um and and that's what it makes it difficult to tease out i i think um, I have certain ideas, but I don't think it would be responsible at this stage to speculate just yet. Because one of my, um, I, I think Japan is also seeing a spike in cases, and maybe it's too early to tell. Like you said, one of my concern has been the high, um, you know, the, the demographic uh, of Japan is older. And, and my concern has always been that, you know, seeing the spike in uh, the death, uh, the number, uh, the mortality rate in Italy, that we were going to, we might also see that in Japan. So far, so good. Uh, but I, I guess this yeah. is something the study will, uh, we will look at uh, hindsight. Um, and, but I think there's some really interesting um, data that we can uh, get from this uh, unfortunate uh, 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 pandemic. Uh, but looking back, I think if we can learn from this very much the way we learn from the Spanish flu, um, how th you know, it will really help us uh, moving forward. And so this is another uh, question uh, coming from the online. Why uh, knowing the origin of the virus is so, why is the knowing the origin of the virus so important? Does it affect uh, the development of the vaccine? 
I think it's important because we want to meet, we want to know uh, next time this happens what to do and be prepared. And I think, as I said earlier, what what this case has shown us, it's only those research groups which have been prepared years in advance who are able now to contribute immediately to understanding the virus. Um, it is When it happens, it's too late. You have to have everything in place. Um, I think that is the main point of, of studying the origin. And if we find out through these studies of origin that it came not from a fish market, but from a bat population, for example, then we know what to do next time. So that, that's an important aspect. Um, separately from that, yes, this research that we conduct directly has an effect on how we're going to develop treatments. Uh, even vaccines, because we need to distinguish those uh, genomic positions and those um, uh, changes in the protein which will influence the vaccines or the treatments. We need to know about that um, before we, we test it in patients. So that's, that is very clearly an applied, uh, yes, an application of, of the research. Um, this is uh, another question. Um, would infected patients um, get immune from the virus and if not, why? Um, again, a difficult question. Uh, there is research both in, in mainland China as well as I believe in Korea, which says that uh, patients who've had it have been reinfected. Um, so that's one view. Uh, and the other view is, which I've heard among some European scientists is, uh, oh, these are false positives. The testing was not uh, reliable. Um, personally, I, it is not directly my field, but as we know from other coronaviruses, about 15% of our colds, our simple colds, are caused by coronaviruses, by harmless ones, and, uh, and we don't get immune to these so easily. So in, potentially, I mean, there is a potential that, you know, the immunity against this virus after infection might not be long-lasting either, but this is entirely speculative, but it's a possibility that we need to be aware of. Um, you are um, speaking to us from UK, um, and we are seeing the numbers uh, go up, and, and but so kind of what are your thoughts on uh, where the UK is in terms of the containment uh, of the uh, COVID-19? Well, my personal impression here in Cambridge is that people are sticking very closely to the government guidelines. So initially you had uh, London, for example, uh, having a, a sharp rise in cases, high mortality rates. Um, but then I think the message really hit home and people have reacted and London has come steeply down. In other parts of the UK, uh, the, the decline has been more gradual. Um, I think, um, in general, um, that that the containment here uh, seems to be working, but but more slowly than than we would like, perhaps. And can you also talk a bit about Sweden too? I initially, my understanding is, UK was going to kind of follow the route of of the you know herd immunity, getting as many people uh, herd immunity, and then uh, but obviously changes direction. Whereas I think in Sweden, they are still uh, kind of, and, but their numbers are, 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 are not that different. I mean, what, what's the, can, do you have any latest information on what's, um, and they're I'm probably not quite up to date on Sweden, but the last time I looked, I think their rates relative to neighboring Nordic countries, Scandinavia, tended to be higher, at least a, a while ago. I don't know if that is still the case. Um, so the comparison is difficult. You know, if you have a population with at-risk individuals, um, so, uh, you know, we, we have a large uh, African uh, population of African descent, of, of um, Indian subcontinental descent who, who are considered at risk. And uh, I know, for example, in Germany, uh, in Scandinavia, perhaps uh, the immigrant population there comes from, from the Middle East. Um, rather than, you know, directly from Africa. It, these are very difficult comp comparisons to make between countries. So it's not in the age profile, it's composition of the population, which has to be taken into account. Um, this is another question. Um, since infected patients might not get the immunity, how effective would vaccine work? 
Well, again, we don't even have the vaccine yet, so I wish I could answer that. But um, I, I think, again, we have to be open to the possibility that new vaccines have to be regularly developed uh, every time the virus comes around. That, that certainly is a possibility. Um, besides, uh, previously, we had talked to um, other uh, uh, experts, uh, knowing that vaccines is not going to be around, be here for another year or so, maybe two, um, drug treatments are also an area where um, many of the uh, experts are looking into. So, um, so can you also talk about that? I mean, you know, AIDS have the, the cocktail, and um, and and since uh, your your wife uh, is a medical doctor, so can you also talk about some of the the, the possibility of, of your uh, study um, helping with the, uh, the, the the drug treatments uh, to uh, handle this this situation? Uh, yes, with pleasure. So um, uh, I've been contacted here by uh, Cambridge colleagues who are looking at the possibility of developing what are called uh, single chain antibodies. Now, uh, antibodies normally consist of several protein chains which our body produce and then they uh, help combat the infection. Um, the trouble with these antibodies is they, they need to be grown by, say, higher organisms and that takes time. Uh, whereas if you have single chain antibodies, it's much easier to reproduce them in, in large numbers and, and to get them to work uh, immediately. So I think for a rapid response, that is a, a very promising avenue for treatment. And that is what we're looking at now to develop this with our colleagues here. Um, there is another question here. Uh, uh, I, I, this is a kind of a technical question. Are the coronavirus type D614 and G614 related to Dr. Forrester's type B and C? I don't know if you can answer that. that. No, that's a brilliant question. And this is exactly the type we were talking about before. This is a B type. So we have the A, B and C types in our system. And the B has uh, a certain type, which is, uh, uh, which is seen in Shanghai, that traveled to Germany. And it has this particular mutations, uh, which you mentioned just now, and has become the dominant type now everywhere where it arrives. And this is potentially due to the fact that patients with it have this higher viral load. Okay. Um, right now, I think we're running out of questions here, uh, but what are some of the things that you right now are, uh, you know, um, concerned about uh, in terms of short-term and long-term, uh, you know, that, that you are looking into? I, I think um, I would like to look possibly more into the origins question because uh, unexpectedly to me, it has become a great uh, uh, focus of interest and um, perhaps it's worthwhile looking into that again. Um, but also I'd like to look into the future of treatment because uh, of course, with my wife also being a medical doctor, we, we have a natural interest in in being able to help people. Um, and it would be wonderful if, if we could find the resources and, uh, and the help in order to, to move that forward. Um, there, there is a lot of competition at the moment for research funding um, because obviously many researchers see the possibility uh, really to de develop their careers and, and uh, make an impact here. Uh, but also it, it requires researchers who already are established with the methods in order to help them to move on. So we, we need, a, I think, a mix of the two kinds of support in order to combat this, this disease. Great. Um, uh, here, uh, in terms of treatment, what's the major obstacle uh, within the developers and researchers? Um, I think that um, there is quite a bureaucratic process to go through in order to get support if you have a good research idea. So um, also I have to say there is probably quite a lot of competition um, because if the money goes to person A, then it doesn't go to person B. And, and, and that is, um, I think, a, a concern. So if you have new ideas, then um, it's more difficult to, um, to get support than if you are doing standard uh, techniques. 
that, that is, I think, a concern of mine. Um, but right now, I mean, we're hearing about, um, I think, the, the Gates Foundation, many of philanthropic dollars are also being, uh, you know, invested uh, in whether institutions are finding vaccines. And I think is that, you know, that's always been there. Um, uh, and also there is a lot of wealth in this, in the world. And I guess uh, yeah. it, it, trying to find uh, in, in terms of the collaborative and, and uh, attracting the philanthropic dollars or, or foundation support and so on. Um, and institutions like Cambridge and, uh, and uh, other institutions, I think it is really interesting time to see, and, and also government. I kind of get the sense that Chinese government themselves are also very much uh, interested in, in, in uh, finding uh, whether it's vaccine, vaccine or, or, or uh, because a lot of their population, I guess anybody who can find it first mm -hmm. will do very well yeah. uh, in, in the, you know, uh, whether it's uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies or, uh, mm -hmm. or countries. So I, I think, and even yeah. what do you say to, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we're hearing um, the UK government um, in terms of the dollars that they are also looking at trying to find the, the vaccine. They're investing in a lot of uh, money. So can you talk a bit about that? What, what the, the government, UK government is looking at? Um, uh, um, so, well, uh, I mean, I'll just make general points, I suppose. I mean, we do have uh, initiatives. I think the Jenner Institute is now being funded in order to find vaccines in Oxford. That, that is true. Um, there are startup schemes for uh, 20 million pounds, which were offered in in, in March, I think for, uh, you know, these are um, fairly modest sums which um, are being offered to existing structures. And um, I think uh, uh, we could speed things up. And I can speak also possibly for the experience in, in, in Germany that it's uh, by no means fast or trivial uh, to get at, at, at this funding. It's, um, uh, it's a contrast, I think, to when billions were immediately uh, provided to, to save banks a few years ago, uh, but we're not talking about the same level of, of investment now in order to look after our health. I mean, I, I unfortunately have to say that, and I'm not pointing at any particular government here. Right, I guess, yeah, that's a choice. Is saving our companies or saving our health? I think it is, uh, those are the questions that um, we've been all asking ourselves. But here it also mentioned the, this question, very similar to the, the, the last question. It says lots of foundations have been donating to medical research. Uh, it seems that lots of resources and money are involved, um, but what's the missing part uh, for finding the treatment? Um, well, I think um, we have been living with certain viruses for, for decades and um, perhaps virology is not as interesting for research funding than, uh, for example, cancer research, which is also extremely important, something I'm also interested in. Um, but uh, perhaps you really have to try new routes rather than, um, uh, you know, people from dis different disciplines to come in and to add their expertise. I think uh, a part of it is simply to broaden your research base in order to try out different avenues. Um, okay, and I guess I heard also recently um, somebody said, you know, they don't have a vaccine for SARS, uh, there's no vaccine for AIDS, and we are still going on. But I guess with this COVID-19, the way it's been affecting so many of us, or more like the flu, um, so I guess the urgency of finding the vaccine um, is uh, is very much um, a kind of a global uh effort. So we hope uh, within the near future, uh, because uh, the idea of not traveling or not interacting and, and being grounded and being locked, um, I'm, I'm not sure any of us can take this much longer. But in Hong Kong, uh, we're coming out of it uh, slowly, uh, but surely. But, uh, you know, the government, it is still worried. And I'm sure it's the same going to be all over um, uh, throughout the everywhere. I think uh, it, there is no end game yet. And I think we have to continue to uh, uh, look at and start, uh, uh, continue to, to kind of 
look at into the look with to the scientists and looking to the researchers and um, to look for some answers and uh, and collaboration is very much the um, the key. So on that note, I is there any last word before we sign off from uh, Dr. Hey. And may I just agree with you? I think collaboration is important. Uh, there is some healthy competition among scientists, but there is also unhealthy competition. But I'm hoping that um, collaboration uh, will, in the end, uh, win the day. Great. Thank you for that uh, uh, thought. And uh, on that note, I want to thank all of you for being uh, with us. Um, our motto has always been, uh, we're in this together. It's not COVID-19. It doesn't just affect uh, uh, one population or one country is affecting all of us and we're all living with it. In fact, I, I was telling some young people, we're living through history right now, whether we like it or not. And we will come out of this uh, together uh, and, uh, and learn from this. And I think uh, building on the research uh, of others and really uh, continue moving forward. That's all we can do. And we encourage all of you to come back uh, for future. In fact, this series will continue uh, look at it in our Asia Society Hong Kong website uh, for future COVID-19 updates. We expect to do one uh, another week or two. And there are other uh, COVID-19 related programs, uh, not only at Asia Society, but also on our uh, Asia Society Hong Kong, but also in a greater Asia Society network. And it's all available on our website. And again, thank you all for being with us and good afternoon. And thank you, Dr. Forrester, for taking time from your busy schedule. Good luck with your work, and uh, we look forward to uh, perhaps having you back in future uh, programs. Thank you all for being with us, and good afternoon. Thanks.